as the, the mammoth job this is. It is everything digital. You're going to digitise everything? Yeah. It's the next, the next step. Alan's going to take them all, well, not today obviously. We're going to track, take them to Alan's studio in, in uh, Bristol. It'll take 18 months to digitise all these. Well, Alan, there's a, there's a couple of boxes open here, so let's have a look and see what. You have a go, pull, well, there's pull some a couple out. There's some names that we recognise straight away Honeycombs, Honeycombs, Tony Dangerfield. Well, yeah, they had a big hit, Have I the Right, didn't they? That's right, I think, yeah. I think it sold you know, a couple of million copies. Yes. But I mean, um, and a lot of this tape stock is interesting. Not this one, but a lot of this tape stock is Russian tape stock. Where you would get Russian tape yes. in 1960, I have no idea. But uh, there you go, let's see what's on this tape. <laughs> well, actually this, this one says crap tape on there. I'm not sure if that's Joe Meek's writing or... So it says Daniel, tracks with voice poor, it's all crossed out dub of Mrs. Jones, and then in big letters, crap, crap tape. tape. So yeah. Joe wasn't too impressed with that. Well, let's hope that's Alan? a band name and not a description <laughs> of what's in the, in the box. But, um, but this makes it so exciting because we, yeah. we don't know who Daniel is. We don't know whether it's really a crap tape. No. Maybe you think it's amazing now. And, you know, I think the nuggets are, are really what this whole thing's about, more so than the, the, the big names. Yes. So... Yes. Uh, I can't even read this. Oh, just like Eddie. That just yeah, that's the... Heinz. Just yeah, like Heinz, Eddie. Just yeah, like Eddie. That yeah. Was a hit. So that was a big hit. Yeah. So we don't know whether that's an alternative take or Who the knows? original master, or it could be one of the backing tracks. Yeah. Because he would so... have built the, t the he would have built the song up. You see. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I mean, there's stuff like this where where there's just very little information. You know, the society would come in very useful with that. There's, yes. there's people there yeah. that would help you identify that stuff. Yeah. And so let's take out one more. So that says October 1965. C-R-I-S. Chris and, and Chris and Group Audition. Audition. And it's, this tape has been used a few times because... Yeah. Is that Jamie Boy? It's been written on there and crossed out. Glenda. That was probably Glenda Collins. Glenda also... Honeycombs. This tape's been used yeah. about four times. Uh, and and in, in Joe Meek's career, there were times when he was absolutely broke. So what he would... T let's assume this tape would be 20 minutes long. So what he would do is record, say, two songs by an artist. And then somewhere along the line, he needed some tape. Rather than tape over it, he would turn the tape over and use it from the back forward. Right. So I'm sure we're going to come across tapes where you've got sound coming at you from one direction and then halfway through you get a track coming at yes. you backwards. Yeah. Okay, we'll put out one more last one because this just excites me just pulling these out and just not knowing what's on here. So this one here, a different mate this one. Tony Dangerfield. Yeah, tracks Once Upon a Time. I don't know that track. Do you know that no, track? No, I don't. Let's have a look. So this is this is Russian tape stock. That's, that's Russian writing there. Yeah. yeah. So Joe Meek was involved with a guy called Major Banks who kind of financed him That's for some right, of his Major career. Major Banks, yes. And I'm sure that Major Banks, being ex-military, probably managed to do a deal with someone and bought some tape from God knows where, you know, East Germany perhaps or something. But um, yeah, Russian tape stock. I've never come across that before. Yeah. But as you can see, it looks like... Deutsch is a German. Perhaps German word, East German obviously. tape for the, for the Russian market. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. No doubt all will be revealed. Well, that's your job. Yeah. Good place. Thanks to, to you. Stop. Thank you. All will be revealed. So normally when tapes are in pretty bad condition, if you run your finger across like that, you get like a residue. Okay. Cliff has done a great job in, in keeping these so they're okay, all good. kind of... You know, the, these wouldn't have been the original boxes they came in. Put them in they the, came in tea chest, the, the tea yeah, chest tapes, right. didn't they? So, so they came in tea chests. They're, uh, they're a lot better than they could have been. Yeah. And uh, I just said to Cliff actually upstairs, you know, isn't it nice that... I'm struggling to get that back in there again. Not only is he salvaged them in the first place 52 years ago but he's kept them in good condition yeah it was in an air-conditioned environment he had them for until yeah. they came here yeah. yeah 
So yeah, that's a quite a storage. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're going to have to hire probably a seven ton truck. These weigh about two tons. Do they? Right. Yeah. So Cliff, we first met about six years ago okay. at the Classic Rock Awards at the Roundhouse. Mm -hmm. and we didn't know each other, obviously. We were at a big table together and we started talking about Joe Meek. Yes. And then I realised that you were the legendary Cliff Cooper I wouldn't say that, that had <laughs> the T-Chess tapes. Okay. And, they, and they were, and they still are, legendary because they've been talked about in Joe Meek circles and outside that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you were also in a band called The Millionaires, mm -hmm. which were recorded by Joe Meek at Holloway Road. Yeah. So let's start up by just telling us what, what the experience was like working with Joe Meek in his flat stroke studio. OK. Um, well, first I was in a band with my brother Kenny called The Rocking Chairs. And anyway, we, I, I, be on and off in the band he would be, be but he was always working with the band and he, he he went for an audition with Joe and Joe liked the band and then Kenny um, said do I want to come along to make the record and we went and uh, recorded Wishing Well which was very good well relatively successful um, Joe I mean I have to say I thought Joe was a really nice guy I mean I never ever had a problem with him he was, he was gentle. I thought very considerate in lots of respects, and um, and I, I have to say, I think he was patient as well. <laughs> I mean, um, so I think the thing with the producers, when they they usually work not just in the afternoons, but probably they burn the midnight oil and they work all, all through the night, and it's till they really have dropped almost. And then I, I guess he would go to bed and uh, they get up the next morning, and the band would come up, bang in there drum kit so they carry out the stairs and he might get a little bit um a bit snappy but i, I think that's to be expected yeah because yeah, he was living he lived in, there, in the yeah. same in the same building as the studio so he yeah. couldn't really get away from it could he no and when you're recording it does you know i've had recording studios and i've done badly produced things myself but um it, it takes it out of your recording because you're listening all the time and when you do go to bed you've got that tune going around in your mind uh yeah it's it's not the easiest of jobs to do and i yeah. um but my my experience was he was he was always very courteous very helpful a nice i'd say he was a nice bloke if you ask yeah. me um and um he was uh, apart from um uh, he was very clever. I mean, when we recorded Wishing Well, um, I thought, yeah, you know, it's not a hit. You know, it was okay. It was an okay song. But by the time he'd finished with it, and he, um, I mean, he, what he did, he, he asked the guitarist to play the other side of the bridge. And I'm surprised, if you play the other side of a bridge and you move your fingers, this side of the bridge, it st you can still hear it. It makes it, and, and he, it made like a bell sound. And um, when we actually heard the, the tape back, it, it, I couldn't believe it. It was he, he created something that I th that wasn't there to begin with, uh, you know. Um, and the other thing I thought he had a um, he got a great vocal sound. He I, um, and that's one of the things we'll probably come on how, how I got to buy the tapes because I, um, I he. I think he, he died in 1967, February, wasn't it? And um, I just was building the Orange Studios. Um, and we opened in September 68. And during that period when he died, I thought it would be fantastic to get to buy some of the equipment. And I contacted um, the liquidator, I found out, the liquidator. Um, and he said, well, I, I don't know. I think a lot of it's gone. You've got to ring the solicitor. And I rang the solicitor. Um, and I remember clearly it was a, a Mr. Jeanette. Um, and it, he said that the equipment's been sold. And I, I said, oh, I am. So he said, but um, there is some things. If you want to come along and see me, um, we can talk about some. Like, there is some other things. Um, but he didn't say what. And. Um, I had an appointment to see him, I went along to, he was based in Lincoln's Inn Fields. Um, and I walked into his office and 
you know, it was like out of the past then. He had half moon glasses. I would say he was about 80 years old. Um, and, um, you know, you've got leaded light windows in there and files all over the place. And, um, and he's, he said, uh, Mr. Cooper, um, and he's quite stern. And I said, yes, he said, and then he started asking me really, it was like a third degree, your name, your parent, he wanted to know everything about me. And I, and I said to him after, I said, you know, well, why are you asking me all these questions? You know, I've, he said, well, um, I've got a situation. He said, I've got a, a tapes, all the tapes that uh, Mr. Meek recorded. <clears throat> and he said that my instructions are really, and my gut feelings, I should destroy them because they will be a legal nightmare. People wanting the tape. And he said, but what I, I can do, um, I can sell you these tapes, but only the physical tape. Is that something you would like? So there was no rights to the recordings as such, obviously. No copyright at all. You it just, just got the quarter the physical inch tapes. tapes. And one of the questions he, he asked me, because you know, I told him I was a shoot, he said, well, why would, I can sell it, but why would you want them? I said, well, you know, I'd like to listen to some of the tapes and you know, perhaps even use the tapes to go over, you know, because tape's expensive. <laughs> and that's what Joe Meek did with a lot of these, he didn't he? Over, he yeah. kept using the same tapes. Because they're expensive yeah. tapes, yeah. So, um, anyway, <clears throat> I said, yes, I would be interested. Um, is there any more um, recording equipment um, he said, no, it's all, all gone. But he said, look, I don't, I can't bring myself to destroy these tapes, but when, if I sell these to you, he said, you can only buy the physical tape, not what's on them, because that's all copyrighted. And he, and he actually said, if you do anything with these tapes, it will be a litigation nightmare. Yes. So um, anyway, we, we agreed a price, and I was quite excited about them, I think. Um, I think it was about three or four hundred pounds we paid for it. it wasn't very much. Well, it was in those days. Yes, you know, it's uh, worth a lot more now, obviously. Uh, yeah. yeah, and um, we went, um, I took, you know, we went over to collect them. I think it was in Ballamore, it was South London in a, a w old warehouse. And uh, I took a, I had an old Bedford van then, and um, I drove down there, <laughs> but we had to make about four or five journeys. I didn't realise that, and of course the tea chests take up a lot of room, and, and you can only get so many tea chests so in a bag. They, they were called the tea chest tapes, so when you bought them, they were actually in wooden tea chests. They were in tea chests, chest. oh they yeah. Were, they yeah. weren't known as the tea chest tapes then, you know, but I called them, there were 67. Yes. All together. 67 boxes. Tea chests. Tea chests, right. Full of tapes. Yeah. 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 And they were all loose, you know, when I say loose, They'd just been thrown in the boxes. They weren't really, and you know, just stored. And we t I took them back, and um, I, I didn't know quite where to put them, so I put them in our studios. We had it, um, it was the, below the ground, and it was the, the temperatures. It's really important when you store tapes to keep them at an even temperature. Yes. Um, and they mustn't get damp or go near any magnets. You know, if I had a, a speaker and I put it, it could erase the tape. In fact, I remember years ago they'd wrap the tapes in Baco foil if they went down on a tube, because a tube, the engines from a tube could cause a radiation into the, and cause a noise on the tape. Um, so um, they were there, I, I played a couple, um, and I thought they're incredible, you know. Yeah. I, and um, I listened to, you, I could tell how he, he used to build the tracks up. He had, I'm sure he had, he had a, a, a mono machine, and then he got a stereo machine. And what he would do, he would record a track and bounce down to a track. So then he'd record on a track, and then he'd put, say, uh, a tambourine or something, else, and record that onto the the neck the stereo track below then he'd go back to the first track and then he'd, he had another tape recorder and he would build up the tracks and it's totally different now uh, with digital you can have 60 100 tracks um no noise or anything but of course he had the problem when he, the more to, every time he bounced you'd bring a bit more noise onto the track yeah um but you know i'm interested so once you got them, you were storing them in, in your own warehouse there. Mm. So did you sometimes take a tape home and play it? What did you do with them? For? Um, 
I had a Revox at home, uh, and I took a couple home and I played them two or three, and um, it was I found it really interesting. Um, but of course, they weren't catalogued. Yes. I had no idea what what was on them, so I play tapes, and I have to be honest, some of them were just backing tracks, some of them were building up the tracks, and. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't something you would just play a tape and listen to a, a completed master. Or and were song. most of them marked what they were, or some? Were? Some were, some weren't. Yes, so that must be exciting. You take a tape, yeah, I didn't no know, markings. Didn't know who it was. You <laughs> have to guess who it is. Yeah, and of yeah. course we've got. As, as we talk, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna lean over here because, of course, as they're so close, take some of these. So. This is some of the tape. Oh, in fact, is there any tape? These are just boxes. That's not a very good start. The, they're the spare. But they're the one. The they're spare, the spare ones. boxes. But yeah. Like here's a couple here. It just oh, says yeah. Terry McGrath, yeah. Lee Walker. This, this is Joe's writing, is it here? Yes. Yeah. So that's Lee Walker and or Terry McGrath, mm. and this one here. Looks like David somebody. And here it says nothing. So it really is Good an tape. adventure. <laughs> and now Trey Red yeah. has bought these tapes from you. Yeah. Of course we've got the, the job of, of we'll get Alan Wilson who's going to do this later to explain, but we've got the job of actually baking them, transferring them to digital and finding out if we can who's on here. Because oh, yeah. it's going to be a mystery sometimes, isn't it? It is. Well, we did have them catalogued, um, but this was quite... A, I have to say, by the way, the, the tapes in the boxes are much better than those odd ones <laughs> in that box. I don't <laughs> well, know. I like, the, I like the mystery of this, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we've got a tape called at home. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we, um, um, we catalogued them. And it, yes. the guy called Alan Blackburn. Yes. And he, he wrote the numbers on them. Um, yeah, it was it wasn't an easy job to do, but he was an enthusiast. He he loved Joe Meek, and I believe he, uh, Alan's part of the Joe Meek Society anyway as yeah. well. Yeah. So you've had the tapes hmm. for fifty two years. Hmm. It's a long time, Very and long today time, yeah. is the day <laughs> when they're passed over yeah. to Trey Red. Do you feel a little bit sad about that? No, no, no. I'm, I'm really pleased. Um, <clears throat> I mean, they've never been a liability, but I had to do something with them. You know, I'm getting older now. And if something happened to me, um, what would happen to the tapes? Um, but of course, it was over 50 years, and a lot of them are out of copy right now, I guess. Certainly 50 years. Um, and it was um, How can I... That still came easily this time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ian. Ian, I, I, be, uh, I was talking to Alan and earlier on, and I tried to do deals with the tape. Something always happened to stop that stopped it. it. Wasn't money. It was it that would never came into the situation. It was always I wanted them to be be able to be released, but I, I. I couldn't go to one of the very big record companies because if they if I did, they'd just take out. Perhaps a David Bowie, because it was his first audition there. Conrad's, yeah. The Conrad's, yeah. yeah. Um, and they'd probably perhaps take, take out the status quo. I think they were called the Palominos. I mean, um, I didn't know any of this until later, but perhaps they take out the most value and they get buried. They would, I don't think they would bother to do anything with them. I might be wrong, but I don't, I don't think so. So um, when Cherry Red came along, I mean, Cherry Red are famous, in fairness, for for, for, that's what you do. You, you find these tapes and you release them on compilation albums and I think just as important you get the sleeve notes right too. It's a caring sort of company and, and the sleeve notes are really important and I, I, I only read this the other day on the internet that when Rod Stewart he came down to audition with Joe. He was only 16 apparently and um, Joe said well I like the band, but I think you've got to get rid of the singer. <laughs> <laughs> but that's lovely. I mean, yeah. that, to me, I think that's that's 
the magic about Joe Meek. You know, some yeah. you win, some you lose. Um, and, you know, uh, he apparently he turned the Beatles down. But then perhaps if he had assigned the Beatles, they wouldn't be where they are now. Yeah. So you can't tell. It's just the way things, fate happens and things work like that. But um, I think, yes, I'm, I'm very happy that they're going to Cherry Red. And I know they'll, you'll do a good job, especially I mean, you're a caring person. And um, yes, I feel I'm happy that, 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 that it's done. And yeah. um, of course, if there's anything that comes up um, that I find out about, I'll, you know, that would be interesting to learn about, I'll, of course, I'll let you know. Tony Dangerfield. Yeah, I, I saw a lot of Tony Dangerfield in there. Did you? Hmm. Think about Tony. Yeah. I was going to say it's Michael Jackson, but I was probably lying, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> that would be a fine, wouldn't it? Yeah, that yeah, one's got RGM sound on it as well. Yeah, that's yeah. It. Hey, that's his notepaper. Yeah, Maze Director RJ Meek. Oh, there's his telephone number. That'd be interesting. I, I yeah. Think. Yeah, so. Yeah, you must you must do photograph everything as well. Yeah, I think um, Richard Anderson was talking. He's got about the idea that. of a book yeah, of, yeah. of the actual. He's going to photograph book. every tape. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if this is Joe's writing. That's quite exciting to think that Joe Meek would have would have. He used to write on a lot. Of did he? Yeah. Before. So apart from apart from us and maybe Alan Blackburn touching these tapes, the last person to have touched these was probably Joe Meek. Yes. It's incredible. No, these, these have been boxed and uh, yeah. put them back in the right order if I can find the numbers. This is a massive, uh, massive chunk of music history. Yes. Yeah, it's um, 499. Nine. That's way out of sync. There, there, none of them are in sync here. Yeah, there. Okay. There you go. Maybe 2,000 tapes, I think. I think it's 1,864 yeah. tapes. 1,800? 1,864 times. <laughs> yeah. He worked hard, that's sure. So we were, yeah. we were basing mm. our calculations on 100 a month transfers. Yes. Taking 18 months. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Well, but isn't that allowing you, you know, you can't have the weekends off, Alan. You know, you can't <laughs> go, the job's got to be done. Mm. Yeah. No holidays for 18 months. No, exactly, sure. yeah. Who would that be? Tommy? Scott probably, does it no, say? No, it says, looks like. Backings or something. Oh, oh, Maybe it's just Tommy and then backing. Give a fellow. So what would B B dash T only mean? Backing track only? Backing track only, yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. So Alan, Alan Wilson, you're the man who's gonna these tapes are gonna in a few days be shipped down to Bristol. That's correct. You have a studio there. They're gonna be stored by your studio. And for the next, what, 18 months? It's going to take that, yeah. You're going to just describe the process briefly of what you have to do with the tapes. Well, analogue tape um, is an unstable format, basically. So uh, in layman's terms, uh, an analogue tape is three components. It's a strip of plastic, a strip of glue, and a strip of oxide dust. The oxide is the bit we want. That's what contains the music. And what no one realised all those years ago, certain tape brands, the glue that holds the oxide to the strip of plastic becomes porous over time. And although we can't see it, there's moisture in the air all around us. Yes. This gets absorbed by the glue and the glue becomes unset. So 20, 30 years later, you could take a tape out of a box, put it on a tape machine, unwittingly play that tape. And if that glue has become unset you, you you lose the bit that we want which is the oxide um, can damage the tape bits of oxide can fall off sometimes the backing on the tape comes off and gets stuck to the previous layer there's all sorts of problems with tape so 20 odd years ago we got involved in tape baking so that process involves uh, a kiln we've got two kilns now but it involves a kiln um, which you bake the tape at a very low temperature anywhere between four hours and sometimes two days, depending on the, the condition of the tape. These are actually in pretty good condition. Uh, there's a, an extractor fan, so it dehumidifies within the kiln, sucks the moisture back out of that glue, resets the glue, and then the tapes are in much better condition then to start working on and putting them on a the machine. And then you turn it into a digital file? 
eventually probably isn't quite as eventually yeah that, that's yeah. right yeah but because that, the, the, the problem is with tape is is we have to try and recreate the conditions of the original tape recorder so the original tape recorder the heads align in different ways and they get worn over the years and uh, we have to try and sometimes there are no test tones on on tapes so we have to try and uh, even if the tape was set up wrong all those years ago we've got to try and recreate that to get yeah. the sound off the tape if you see what I mean it's a lot of trial and error uh, and then there, there's sometimes no Dolby information on tape so we have to figure out what Dolby's encoded if any is encoded onto the tape so we can decode it and eventually once we've got the best result we can then we turn it into a digital file which is stable so I'm just taking out the box just the box I pulled at random and this is Lonely Joe Tom, yeah. jo is it Tom, Tom Jones, Jones. Tom Jones, right. Jones so actually, actually a great yeah. track I've heard the track yeah yeah so this one here, this tape, this is in fairly good condition. Looks like it's in good condition to me, comparatively. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough. Um, Cliff allowed me to take some tape away oh, to right, inspect yeah. uh, seven weeks ago. Yes. And I was quite surprised how well they've aged. And, and this is in good condition because Cliff had the know-how to, to store them correctly. Yes. Um, if they had gotten damp or if they'd been stored incorrectly, this would be a whole different... Uh, we'd be talking about a whole different story now, you know, this could, we could, this could have been lost forever. Yes. Had they not been stored correctly. Yeah. So, so for that, I'm grateful to Cliff. Yes. Because this is my world. Yes. Know? So not only is it your world in terms of this is your profession and you, you enjoy the challenge of turning an old tape into a digital file, but of course you're a, you're a lifelong Joe Meek fan. I'm so a Joe Meek enthusiast. It means through. something yeah. to you Definitely. to be working on these tapes. Yeah. As I said to Cliff, I didn't think in my lifetime I'd ever see these tapes. And here I am touching them. I've taken some away, tested them. Yes. Um, it's an incredible feeling for me because I've been a Joe Meek enthusiast since I was a teenager. I'm 58 now, so yeah. you know, 40 years of, of being a Joe Meek enthusiast. So what is the general feeling amongst the real Let's call them hardcore Joe Meek fans. Do, do they actually believe the tapes exist? Because it's like almost a yeah. mythical thing, isn't they, they it? They believe the tapes exist because Alan Blackburn uh, did some cataloguing years ago. And so, you know, people got to hear about that and, and, and it kind of piqued people's interest, I think, to, to wonder exactly what's in there. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of people going to be very, very pleased that this deal has yes. happened and that they're going to get to hear some of this material. Yes, well, it'll be a time before they hear it because it's a quite a process. Yeah. And I think from our point of view at Cherry Red, it's not just a case of taking out the better names, better names like Tom Jones and David mm. Bowie and whatever. It's actually the challenge of going through everything, yeah. finding out what we've got in terms of uh, what we can identify to start with. Yeah. And I guess the Joe Meek community might even be able to help you to identify I'm certain sure. things. Yeah. And then we have to decide the best way to release them. And again, that will be, yeah, that's really exciting to new box sets of the T-Chess tapes. Yeah, I think there's going to be, because I'm not the only Joe Meek enthusiast. There's a lot of people out there uh, very excited about Joe Meek. So this will be big news. Yeah, so, so why, why is Joe Meek so special to you? That's a long story, which I'll try and cut short. Um, when I was a kid, I was a fanatical record collector, and this is in the early 70s, mid 70s. Really, I guess before record collecting was a thing. And um, I realized at quite a young age that certain records sounded better than others. And if I, if I had to put it into words, I would say certain records have a sort of urgency and a sense of like excitement about them, a vibe, I guess you could call it, and some records just don't. And, I realised that within these records that I was collecting, certain records really stood out sonically. Uh, so I could I could quote John Layton, Johnny Remember Me, or Wild Wind, another great that example. Was, that was, Johnny Remember Me was Joe's first number one hit. First number it? one hit, yeah. 1961, I believe. A number one hit recorded in a living room of a flat above a bag shop in Holloway Road. I mean, it's incredible. The story's incredible. And then you take another record and, and you say, well, this one also sounds really good, but it's the Tornadoes and it's Telstar. And it's on Decca Records and John Layton's on Top Rank. And, and as a kid, I thought, well, there's, there seems to be no connection here, but this record sounds great and so does this one, and so on and so on and so on. 
no internet in them days, no reference books as such, you know. And then as time goes on, the dots, the dots begin to join. And I realised that this same guy, Joe Meek, was behind all these great sounding records, even though they're on all these different labels. Because, of course, Joe Meek had his own label for a short while. Triumph. Triumph yeah. Records. Yeah. Um, but then after that, he kind of, he leased records, which I think was quite pioneering in its time anyway. He leased uh, recordings to, to different labels. So you'd find Joe Meek recordings coming out on different, you know, top yes. rank, Decca, yes. uh, Pi or whatever. Um, and I, so, so, so Joe Meek's special to me because of, of the sound he created. He was really innovative. And, and I'm a recording engineer myself these days. And I realised just what Joe Meek did with very limited equipment was incredible. He didn't have multi-track facilities. So he would record on one tape machine and then play that back and get someone to sing along to it and record it on another tape machine and just keep shuttling those tapes around backwards and forwards. Uh, very time consuming. But also, if you do that type of thing, um, you've always got to be thinking two steps ahead because, well, you just because you have it, that's how it works. Um, not an easy thing to do. And the other reason I think uh, Joe Meek is quite special is, is, or one of the other reasons, he took on the music industry and beat them at their own game and, and they didn't really like it much, but he was a maverick. He was an independent record producer, which didn't exist in those days. He set up his own studio in his house, which didn't, that wasn't a thing. It, he was very innovative. And if you can imagine the time we're talking about in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, Recording studios were these palatial buildings with men in white coats and clipboards and boardrooms and, you know, and they didn't much like it that this chap suddenly started up in the Holloway Road in a small flat and he was making million selling records. He wasn't using their facilities, he was doing it. I've worked with a lot of these Jomi artists and they tell me he was doing it behind, the singer would stand behind a little screen, like the ones that ladies get changed behind in the corner of the room and the drummer would be over there and the backing singer would be in the bathroom and wires everywhere. And, and, and the record industry really didn't like that. They also didn't really like Triumph Records because they wanted that kind of monopoly. You know, Decca and all these other labels didn't really want this upstart taking over their business, you know. Yeah. So he was very unpopular, but he, but he still forged ahead. And, and, and I think, uh, if you look at the, the life story of Joe Meek, he always considered himself like an outsider. And I think he was driven to be accepted. That's my own opinion. Yes. I, I don't know that for sure, but I, but I really feel that he was driven beyond what most people would be, the, the, the work ethic that he had was- Well, it was his life, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was his that whole was, life, that was exactly. basically his life. And I think he just really craved to be accepted in yeah. that industry. Yeah. Anyway, you have quite a challenge now, the next 18 months. And I think what we'll do is we'll visit you at some point in Bristol, okay. see how you're getting on okay. with, with, with the tapes and maybe listen to two or three things that you, you found. Okay. And uh, so good luck on your adventure. Thank you. Okay. And thanks for involving me in this. <laughs> <laughs>